There is nothing we should be quite so grateful for as the last line of a poem that goes, when your own heart asks, be resolved, young samurai, and tell the world what you witness here today. Some heroes have possessed such prowess that a single lifetime is insufficient to express it. And so we tell stories of heroes to remind ourselves that we too can be great. Welcome to our first episode explaining Legend of the Five Rings on the It's a Mimic channel. I'm Megan and with me again, with over a decade of experience gaming for L5R, is Roman. In this episode we're going to be looking at the history of the game itself, the last two editions, and the current state of the IP. But before I kind of and we kind of get started, Roman why don't you include like introduce yourself to the listeners. Like regulars of the It's a Mimic should already know me um, because you know from D&D 5th edition listeners, regulars to the It's a Mimic podcast, all that nonsense. We did a Call of Cthulhu edition, actual plays, all that shit. But you've never graced the eardrums of our It's a Mimic listeners with your glorious voice before, so tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> well, my name's Roman. Uh, I'm in my early 30s. I have been ooh, playing role-playing games since I was in, I want to say grade 7. Since you were a ute. Since I was just a, ch just a babies. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my first experience was with 3-5 Dungeons & Dragons. I got the black dragon starter box from uh, a place over on the island this little bookstore that sold incense and you know role-playing games and uh from... great combo <laughs> right <laughs> uh and and from then i was hooked you know i've always been into uh storytelling i was an acting kid growing up uh my love of uh role-playing video games always made it so that uh this was just sort of the natural progression i imagine um yeah i i work as a mechanic I spend a lot of my time either playing video games or writing role-playing games, specifically at L5R, um, or uh, studying the martial arts. And I'm a man of, uh, of many talents, or so I'm told. <laughs> a jack of all trades, shall we say. Oh yes, master of none. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so now that everyone kind of has a better idea of who you are, uh, let's jump into the meat and potatoes of this episode. What the fuck is Legend of the Five Rings? Ooh, I mean, where to start? Let me start at the origins. Well, okay. Take us on a journey. Let's let's start with the origins. Um, Legend of the Five Rings, often abbreviated L5R, is a fictional setting created by John Zinzer, Dave Say, Ryan Dancy, Dave Williams, DJ Trendle, Matt Wilson, and John Wick. First, per first published by a joint venture between Alderac Entertainment Group and Isomedia in 1995. Uh, it was the feature campaign setting of the Oriental Adventures expansion of the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons, and has since received a fifth edition compatible supplement called Adventures in Rokugan. Uh, in 1997, Five Rings Publishing, which was made up of the Alderac Entertainment Group and Isomedia, was purchased by Wizards of the Coast. AEG continued publishing the RPG, and Wizards began publishing the card game. More on that later. In 99, Legend of the Five Rings changed hands once more when Wizards was purchased by Hasbro. However, Wizards continued operations under the original name. Wizards of the Coast re-released Oriental Adventures, a long out-of-print AD&D supplement, changing the setting from its original Karatur to Rokugan, and updating the supplement to the D20 rules. Several of the following sourcebooks provided dual D20 and D10 rule sets. In the late 2000s, Hasbro decided to sell Legend of the Five Rings, two years before AEG's long-standing license was due to expire. AEG won the bidding war for Legend of the Five Rings, and until 2015, continued to design and publish both the card game and the role-playing game. On September 11th of 2015, AEG and Fantasy Flight Games jointly announced that the setting had been sold to Fantasy Flight Games, where I believe it remains. Interesting. Yeah. Even though it's not really in print anymore. So... Because they finished 5th edition, and then, like... We haven't seen a book since. since. yeah. Um, but, like, there's still novels being written, there's still lore being created. Uh, well, that's the thing, not, not really, really? Okay. unfortunately. Um, I believe they announced that they were no longer going to be continuing to do things for the 5th edition of the role-playing game. So, right now, it's kind of in a state of limbo. Mm. That said, we're not too cut up about it. We're not sad. No, because L5R, as a game 
exists entirely independent from its rule set mm -hmm. for a lot of people. My personal belief is that the fourth edition of the game is by and far the best. We all have a bias. It's okay. Oh, yeah, and it's it's only a bias if it's uh, not informed by like you know raw facts and um, the truth. <laughs> This is not just emotions, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a good time to introduce that this podcast will be mostly around the fourth edition. Yes. Uh, a lot of the lore-specific stuff that we're talking about is uh, edition agnostic, mm -hmm. right? There are some differences in where different editions decide to focus a lot of their attention, but really, as long as you have an understanding of the lore as a whole, you can run your game of Legend of the Five Rings in any part of the timeline. Um, the beauty of one of two, well, two of the fourth edition books is that they offer alternate timelines and alternate campaign settings within the world of Rokugan and the setting of Legend of the Five Rings. So uh, if you're able to track them down, you'll have lots of material to work with. Able to track them down is kind of the key the key word here. So we're not supposed to talk about <laughs> how you should get out of print things, I imagine, but there you are can, lots of you ways. You can find books at thrift stores and or other places where you can just purchase these books that are currently out of print. Yes, <laughs> yes. Or purchase the PDFs online. Yes, you, you know what? Drive -through <laughs> RPG has tons of uh, digital versions of these uh, of these books. Yeah. And they're great. There have been times where I've almost bought in like random like little like little things that people make cuz like people will sell their stuff same way that they did with D&D. &D. Of course. They'll sell their stuff and I'm like this is kind of interesting. I kind of want to buy this and I'm just like, "Nah, I'll make up my own shit." <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm one of those kinds of people that like I wouldn't feel comfortable selling my own product, but I'll happily buy someone else's product if it's something that I think I'm going to use, mm -hmm. right? Like, I've written a lot of my own homebrew stuff. I don't think any of it is something that I would put a price tag on, but I would be more than happy to, like, okay, yeah, your stuff's good. Like, you've, you've written a supplement or you've, you know, created a thing. Like, there's so much third-party um, product that has come out for a variety of games that I've really dug into and, of course, cannibalized things from, from my own game. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, if you want to see it in the world, you got to support it. Yeah. Not only that, but, like, because the way the TCG was set up, um, it just bodes custom-built stuff for the campaigns and how you build things in the game and in the world. But, I mean, we'll talk about the TCG later. Yeah. But, like, yeah. I just, yeah, it definitely is. So we, we've talked about the, the history of, I guess, the IP, uh, but we haven't really described to folks what the setting is about. Mm -hmm. And the setting of Legend of the Five Rings and the Emerald Empire of Rokugan is heavily influenced by a variety of Asian cultures, you know, Japan, China, and Mongolia, to name a few. Uh, an important distinction to make, however, is that while it is based in what feels like a fantasy feudal Japan, it is not Japan. Um, there are certain biases and inherent things that you would see in medieval cultures of our world that don't exist in the world of Rokugan in the same way. Like, there's no distinction between roles of, of males and females. Um, there are certain other things that um, I imagine will come up on a on a case-by-case -case basis, but by and large... It is important to treat Rokugan as Rokugan and not to base all of your storytelling decisions around it being Japan. Yeah. Because it's not. That's fair. Um, L5R has a few playable races. If you like your storyteller, don't play anything other than a human. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of the way that the Empire is set up, there are so many rules and so many restrictions and so many expectations of somebody in polite society that you playing a goblin running around throwing poop at things is not really going to fly. It will get yeah. you killed instantly. This is where you're like, um, you know, your murder hobo is not going to live a good life or live very long. So I think the easiest way it's ever been described to me for those who play D&D &D and not really have branched out from that is it's like as if you were playing a campaign within one city and like that one city, everybody has roles, rules, regulations. Um, there's a punishment system. There's a reward system. There is a very definitive line of who runs what and who doesn't run what. And it's as if you were playing in one city, but this is now an entire empire. That there are very specific rules and regulations that everyone follows to maintain, like, the the economy, basically. And there are certain things everybody accepts, and there's certain things that, like, you know, obviously that's where wars come from, is because they go against that and all those kinds of pieces, right? But if you're trying to think of the ecosystem that is Rokugan, it is basically one city that is now one large 
large empire. That is, yeah, that's an excellent description of it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, something you said, like, the, the economy of the empire, right? And, um, the currency of the empire is honor yeah. and glory and status. Um, and these are things that I think separate it from D&D in such a large way. Dungeons and Dragons is a looter shooter. You go, <laughs> you fight. I kill thing. it, I get its stuff. I kill it, I get its stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, give me the loot, boss. <laughs> hey, hey, DM. I rocked up and I killed all of these guys. I expect experience points and I expect a shiny sword. In Legend of the Five Rings, it's I have been using my grandfather's sword this whole time. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I want from this is for people to know that I rocked up with my grandfather's sword wearing my father's armor and that I fought gloriously and honorably. In the name of our clan. Mm -hmm. uh, L5R as a setting is centered very heavily around valor and duty and trying to be a hero in spite of your needs as a person. Mm -hmm. There is a thing that is said about um, both comedy and tragedy, right? That every comedy has a taste of tragedy and every tragedy has a taste of comedy. And in my opinion, that is one of the things that separates... L5R and Dungeons and Dragons most distinctly mm. is that Dungeons and Dragons is Shakespearean comedy. It's funny. It's a little more lighthearted. Some of the things that you encounter are wacky in spite of the fact that a lot of what you can encounter can also be very tragic. Mm -hmm. It's hard to really keep a straight face when you have uh, an elephant rogue and a you know lion bard and a warforged cleric and you know a little girl in her red slippers just telling them all where to go a changeling bard just leading the way <laughs> right <with> the... <laughs> the 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 scope of what dungeons and dragons allows is so much broader and because of that sometimes things can run away on you yeah whereas in l5r while it is a very serious setting it does allow for these kind I, I suppose these light-hearted and warm moments that you wouldn't expect from something that feels so serious and feels so reined in. Yeah. And I mean, for, like, the folks who've listened to It's a Mink before, one of the other things we talk a lot about is called Cthulhu. And I feel like that has a lot of the same emotional entanglements, because you will play mostly humans in Call of Cthulhu. It is a very serious game. There is risks. Like, there is, like, the thing about D&D &D sometimes is that there is no risk to your life, depending on your DM, Right. Whereas Call of Cthulhu is built to be, like, risk management. Like, you are surviving, right? Yeah. I think, I feel like L5R can be the same kind of window into that world, is that it's very much a survivalist game. And it's, and it's very selfless. I think that's what a lot of people don't realize, is that a lot of D&D &D players go into the game thinking, I am going to be the main character, I'm going to do all these things. L5R is very, no, no. <clears throat> Most of you operate as a service. And you are, you're living a selfless life. You're supposed to be living a selfless life. Yeah. And if you go against that grain, that's when your life becomes at risk. And that is very similar to like a Call of Cthulhu game. Yep. Yeah. The, the, the systems of the game encourage you to be a good person and to support the other players at the table and to act like a hero. Yeah. Right? You get punished when you steal things and when you sneak around and when you don't introduce yourself properly to people. Mm -hmm. You are rewarded for letting the person that you're fighting stand back up before you continue to fight with them or by challenging somebody publicly to an honorable duel. All of these things are either rewarded or punished in line with the societal values yeah. of Rokugan. Yeah. So. There are a few important things to discuss before even getting into Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah. So, uh, session zero topics. Mm -hmm. Because L5R is a setting with a lot of with a lot of baggage, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, first of all, it is uh, heavily inspired by Asian cultures. Inevitably people without a level of sensitivity and without an understanding of those cultures might choose to lean into certain Asian stereotypes in their role-playing. Mm -hmm. um, it is a culture with a heavy importance on religion. And so understanding that certain religions and certain cultures, um, understanding the significance of certain religions and certain cultures is important. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's, it's similar to the concept in D&D when you're playing a religious character, like being mindful of the religions that you pick and the gods that you're talking about. Like in Session Zero, those are the things you discuss. What gods are available to you, and if you want to choose these gods, have that discussion with your DM around how you're going to play that out to not be disrespectful to somebody at the table, right? Yeah, and Adventures in Rokugan, the 5th edition supplement, has a phenomenal discourse on all of these things. Mm-hmm. It really lays out for people who just might not have that level of sensitivity or that understanding how these things should be approached and how these things should be addressed like the number one rule is just kind of don't be an asshole yeah and some people forget that yeah don't be a twat just like (laughs) do a bit of research and the beauty of learning l5r is that you're gonna do some research yeah you're gonna pick your clan and you're going to learn things about your clan, and as long as you play it honestly and with intention, mm-hmm. you're probably not going to come across as an asshole. It's true. There is one distinction between uh, Adventures in Rokugan and, I guess, my personal bias towards the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in Adventures in Rokugan, they, they call it the glorifying of ritual suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, now, for folks who may have... Uh, you know, feelings or trauma around this. Uh, here's here's a disclaimer. We're going to talk about ritual suicide for a second. In Rokugan, as a setting, when you die, you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to rock up to your clan's personal heaven and that all of the badasses that came before you are going to sit there and look at you and say, hey, did you live a good life? Did you do what you were expected to do? Did you bring glory to our clan? And if you do you get admitted to the pantheon of badasses and you get to hang around being cool all the time Mm -hmm. and guiding generations of heroes to come after you. If you don't live up to that expectation and live a good life, then you're thrown back into the cycle of reincarnation and you get to go through it all again. If you're lucky, you get to come back as a person. Mm -hmm. You might come back as a a little lizard or like a little little flower. (laughs) (laughs) In, in Roke again, the idea of giving your life is in some ways cheapened, but also reinforced by the idea that you will come back in one form or another. Mm-hmm. The way of the samurai is found in death. And so when choosing to give up your life in order to protect your honor, in order to preserve your family's name, there's a thing that exists there that doesn't really exist in our world. Yeah. Now, that being said, it is not mandatory to play with this as a part of your games. It is something that I play with as a part of mine and something that I discuss with my players openly at the beginning. I am lucky to have had very well-intentioned and thoughtful and compassionate human beings that I've run this game for and I've run this game with, and we've broached a variety of topics. It all starts at a session zero. Mm -hmm. It all starts with an open conversation about what it is you would like to explore and what it is you would like to omit. And I suggest that if you are deciding to get into this, especially if you're deciding to run it, that you have that conversation openly with your players. Yeah. At the beginning. It's very true. Because like if um if anybody picks up the Adventures of Rokugan, which is the fifth edition adaption of um L5R, it removes it completely. There is no mechanic for it. Um and they do discuss that at the beginning of the of the, the book. They give a reasons as to why and give you kind of like a feel for those purposes and reasons. Um but to your point, it's a session zero conversation. And we've talked about session zero a lot on our uh, podcast, but it's usually around the simple things. And by simple things, I put that in air quotes, but it's just like the things like family traumas, um, you know, like um, regular kinds of abuse on a regular basis or like children is even a thing that comes up a lot of times in session zeros for D&D is just there are some barriers that people just have. And it is a good checkpoint to make sure you do. But when you're playing L5R, I think that because you're touching a lot of cultural things and a lot of spiritual things, it is more important to have a session zero for L5R than it is in D&D sometimes. Yeah. Like, my my typical session zero for Legend of the Five Rings, of course, includes the, you know, the consent conversation. Mm. These are the things that I am thinking of including in our game. Is anyone opposed? Mm -hmm. If you are opposed and it is a hard line... I will omit it. And it can be a private conversation. It doesn't 100%. have to be like they can just like message you on the side and be like, these are the ones I'm not comfortable with. And you as a DM make the decide the decision to omit it. No one has to know that that person was uncomfortable with it. Totally. Right? Totally. So the the second part of the session zero is also to create relationships. Yeah. 
because the Empire is relatively small, and because of the way that Rokugani society functions, it is possible that you've met all of these players in various courts, or at certain festivals, or have performed a military service together, or have been on a battlefield across from each other. Mm -hmm. And now, through the course of whatever game you're going to be playing, you will have to navigate some of those pre-existing feelings and pre-existing relationships for the sake of whatever it is you are there to accomplish. Yeah. So... Again, at, I am a firm believer in the session zero when it comes to all things, even non role playing game things. <laughs> uh, this is the session zero to like just our friendship. Um... Oh, is it? Now? <laughs> well, well, let's let's break down some of the differences in the additions, like some of the years that they came out. Really show folks, I guess, what they should expect from playing fourth as opposed to playing fifth of the traditional game. Prove to the world why 4th edition is the edition they should be playing. Oh, let me tell you something about 4th edition. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, for, first and foremost, 4th edition was released in 2010. 5th was released in 2018. And the biggest change between 4th and 5th was shifting away from the, the D10 roll and keep system to Fantasy Flight's proprietary system. Mm -hmm. um, so they use a proprietary D6 and a proprietary D12, skill dice, and attribute dice, uh, and each of them contribute to a pool of successes in a different way. Now, there are other mechanics that come into play, like strife and, I think, like super successes, um, but we're going to sort of leave the nitty-gritty. <laughs> Fair enough. Fourth is a lot more straightforward. It is the roll and keep system, which is 10-sided dice. You make a pool, you choose a certain number of the pool, you count the numbers up. Do you hit a 30? Do you hit a 50? It is clean. Mm -hmm. It is easy enough to grasp once you've done it five times. Yeah. And it doesn't require a chart to no. know if you've done it right or if you've done it wrong. Yeah. You just got to be able to do basic arithmetic. Yeah. No, I, uh, so I just recently ran a, like a short campaign for um, the Adam, Dan, and crew. And uh, one of the main comments that was made is once your character is built, it is a very simple system so that you don't have to focus on the nonsense that is on your character sheet. Yep. You can legitimately spend the time doing the role playing. And then the numbers and the math is the afterthought. Oh shit, I gotta do a thing. Hey, storyteller. Yeah. What do I gotta do? Well, it's this stat and this skill, and you keep the stat. Mm -hmm. Oh, neat, thanks. Yeah. And then, like, because it's so geared towards a more role playing and actually having those conversations at the table, as a like a storyteller, you could give the benefit to them and be like, you get an extra dice because you you spoke that really well. It is easier to reward people yeah. for engaging than it is in other systems. Because in other systems... Giving advantage is is top tier. It's like, a lot. Being able to roll two D20s to like, you know, being able to add an extra D6 to your D20 roll in a system where like, you know, the average benefit is 20 or higher. When you roll a D20, it's 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 a lot more easily rewarded. Whereas when you're rolling a pool of t D10 dice, sometimes you fucking shit the bed real hard. <laughs> yep. Sometimes it doesn't matter how many dice you roll because the dice gods say no. But like the gods sometimes reward the shit out of you. And you get your 10s, you pop them off, and then you just keep rolling your dice. I find that L5R as a system gives you a better average. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I started playing D&D. In recent years, I have realized that the traditional D like Dungeons & Dragons role-playing dice don't like me that much. D20s hate you. D20s fucking hate me. They do. I have been run over by my own die rolls so many times. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what I do, if I put them in a freezer, if I lock them in dice prison, I will get run over by my d20 more often than not. Yeah. But 10-sided dice love me. That's great for you. It's great for me. When, when I first started playing L5R, uh, d10 dice hated me. Like, and I and I hated the system, and I hated E10s, and I was like, this is fucking stupid. But, I don't like this game. But then you started running the game. I did. And now 10-sided <laughs> dice love you, don't they, man? Not fair. No, actually, no, they don't. And, oh. like, my players will attest to you, the final boss battle didn't roll above a 17. Like, <laughs> but on how many dice were you rolling? Like, six to seven dice. Uh... It, was a, it was a hard, hard sell for, like, my fight. Anyways... Yeah, I digress. But to be fair, like, the whole point here is that the 4th edition D10 roll keep system is phenomenally easy so you can focus on other things. Y yes. It 
it is a storytelling system more than it is a mechanically complex system. Yeah. When you really get into the nitty gritty, if you f- spend your time in the weeds, you'll find things that allow you to break the mechanics of the system open. Mm. But the game is also so restrictive in that way that, okay, you make a guy who's really good at doing one thing. He, he is the master of one. Mm-hmm. And that's all he's doing. Even with some of the characters where you make them good at three or four things, they're just kind of bad at three or four things. They're not great. No. Um, it is a game that really supports party dynamic in that we have one guy here made to punch things. We have one guy here to pick locks. We have one guy here to, to have the hard conversations. <laughs> and each of them get their time in the sun because yeah. nobody else in the party is doing that. Fair. Um, what I do love about Fifth, and it's it's kind of weird for me to say that I love Fifth because initially I couldn't fucking stand it. Yeah. It is a system that has a lot of flexibility. Mm-hmm. In Fourth Edition, it is you take your attribute, you take your skill, you roll with the skill and attribute. It's very cut and dry, and there are only certain things that make sense. In Fifth, it is you have a, a ring, an elemental ring, and you can choose any of the rings as your path or your avenue of performing whatever it is you're performing, and then you justify how you're doing it through your role play and through your through your discussion. So if I wanted to take a fire approach to something, I would probably be more you know direct and more boisterous and more full of energy. Whereas if I was to take an earth approach to something, I would be more sturdy and more steady. Mm-hmm. And then you apply skill dice on top of that to you know, augment whatever you're doing. This is a great time to say that the five rings are elementally based. Right. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're going to get into that in a, in a later episode, but yes, the, the reason that it's called Legend of the Five Rings is because there are five rings, each based around the elements believed to make up the world, right? Uh, fire, air, water, earth, and the void. No. That is for a later episode. I know. I just, just for those at home, when we're talking about the rings, we talk about elements. <laughs> you know what? They have Google. They can do research. Okay. <laughs> they came to us for a reason. <laughs> this is their research. <laughs> is, it, is it because I have a lovely speaking voice? No. Damn. <laughs> Hard pass. Oh, well. And that brings us to Adventures in Rokian. Released in August of 22 as a supplement for the 5e rule set by Asmodee and Edge Studios, it presents the best parts of L5R as a setting and takes a pretty firm stance on shying away from some of the more potentially problematic things. For someone who has never played Legend of the Five Rings and is enamored with the 5e rule set, it is an opportunity to get a taste, but it's not what I would call Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah. Right? It makes a lot of the classes or the schools feel more homogenous, Mm -hmm. right? You're not playing a dragon clan Bushi. You're you're playing a warrior, right? You're not playing a Phoenix clan Shugenja. You're you're playing a ritual caster of some sort. Things have been shaved and shaped to fit within the five the fifth edition rule set, and that is okay. It works. And should you choose to include it in your games, hopefully you can do so in a way that also preserves some of the beauty that is Legend of the Five Rings as a setting. Mm -hmm. However, all of those classes can exist entirely independent of the rule set and of the culture that is Legend of the Five Rings, which for me, I mean, I don't fuck with it. (laughs) Back in my day. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Fair enough. As you, as you can tell, I have some pretty firm opinions. It's fair. You know, that's fine. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> we do fifth edition podcasting for a reason. Like, yep. And I, like, again, I'm not here to, you know, I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just here to share my passion and my love and my appreciation of this thing that I have been shoulder deep in for the better part of a decade. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. yeah. And to be fair, like, when I first tried trying to run my own L5R game, D&D 5th edition is what I am mostly, that's my elbow deep in ten, a decade nonsense. Like, that's what I understand. The mechanics, that's what I understand. Mm-hmm. So when they were coming out with the this Rokugan book, I was so excited about it. I remember I messaged you immediately, and I was like, I'm going to buy this book. It's going to be great. This is the most wonderful thing. I'm going to run a campaign. It's going to be wonderful. Talk to, like, Dan, Adam, and them in the crew and said, I'm going to run an L5R campaign for you. We can do it in 5th edition. And I got the book. I picked it up, and I read it. And there's a lot of really good information in there. Yes. 
Like they did a really good job of breaking down how to not be a twat waffle. They yep. did a lot of great work on like making sure there's a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more broadened and like the spectrum of stuff that they give you is really good. Yeah. But it was not L5R. You're correct. And I was like, I this was not the experience I wanted to give my players into the world that again, and now I have been playing for a number of years with you in. And I was like, I don't think I can do this. And I was like, you know what? I've been playing long enough. I think I can teach them the mechanics. I, th- I think you have been playing in my games for like five years. Yeah, off and on. On and off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but like more religiously in the last like three, I would say. Yeah. Um... But yeah, like picking up that book was great. And like, I did take a lot of inspiration from it. Like I built a couple of NPCs using some of their breakdowns. Um, I took a couple of their monsters and like remade them. Yeah. Uh, I took, they did act in the back of the book actually has like a small little campaign that you can play. So I took a couple of like weird little places and like words and names and stuff from nice. that book. Cause it's an easy read. Mm-hmm. Right. I find the L5 or fourth edition book, no offense, um, hard <laughs> to read. And the only reason why it's hard to read is because, like, how you level up, like, a Shugenja for existence is a small blurb on page, like, 125 in the back of whatever. How to do this and how to do that. Like, I had to Google where to find it in the book. I know. And unfortunately, the the fourth edition books, they're written like historical texts. Yes. They are written where it's, here is all of this this lore dump. Here's a little bit of rules. Here's all of this lore dump. Here's some more rules. Here's a small rule for you. And like, they could have just separated it a right. little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I struggled with when I first started trying to DM it and going through like the character building because I've only built so many characters in yeah. my life. And like the, the last time I built a Shugenja was the first time I ever played the game. Of course, I had two people that wanted to play Shugenja. So I'm like, yep. shit, I have to remember how to learn how to build a Shugenja. So like I went to the fourth book and I couldn't find the information I needed. So I had to Google where to find it in the book. And that was the frustrating part. Whereas like the the Rokugan book that came out for fifth edition D&D is laid out a lot easier to digest. It's laid out like a fifth edition book. Yeah. So it's <laughs> And it's all the information that you need in the right places that I was used to finding. Yeah. Right. And so I did find myself referencing that book a lot just to get ideas and figure out a couple, little bit of the lore that I may not find in that small little italicized passage in the bottom of the left corner of page 199. You know, like it just... <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It it can be a steep climb yeah. to the summit of the mountain. Yeah. But boy is the view sweet. Yeah. <laughs> once once you figure it out and once you have like the thing like I started taking pictures of the book just so I didn't have to flip through the book anymore for things. Like it was like we redid this the DM screen for me when like yes. I started playing because the information just didn't make any sense. And like it's just one of those can't it's just one of those things that I find that they did a good job in this book of laying out how to navigate in a world that is very hyperly specific and themed. And it's a big book. Yeah. Um Yeah, she's thick, bro. She's thick, man. At <laughs> least three C's. Oh, like oh she's four C's thick. <laughs> That's too many C's. Never enough C's. <laughs> But yeah, in comparison to like how digestible it is, it again, it's an easy read and I enjoyed it. Yeah. But it is not what I ended up using when I went to go play L5R with my group. Hmm. Fancy that. Yeah. So you ended up running your game using the fourth edition rule set. I did. Fancy that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was this guy that's like, this is probably going to be better. And I'm like, "Eh, I don't know enough about this game to do this. And then again, the main comment from my players was even... The system is really easy to learn. And then once it's learned, it's, again, it's all about the role play and just learning the dynamics of how to operate in the world and the society. Yep. The the mechanics of 4th edition fade into the background, and then it becomes exclusively about who you are and what you are trying to accomplish. Yeah. No, it's very true. Sounds like a smart guy. (laughs) Nah. Not the smartest. (laughs) So that, you know, at the end of the day, like, do you have anything more about the Adventures of Rokugan book? Uh, no, I like, again, for for most of our audience, I think that it is a phenomenal book for you to pick up. Especially if you are thinking of dipping your toes in to Legend of the Five Rings as a setting. And if you're not sure if you want to take the full plunge into the fourth edition rule set. That's what the rest of this series is going to be about, is going to be me trying to convince you that fourth edition is going to be one of the best decisions you ever make, or mm-hmm. have are voluntold to make. <laughs> but it was the best decision that you were voluntold to make. Uh, you know what? Strangely enough, the role-playing game was exclusively my choice. Yeah. I had another storyteller who had spent 
twice the amount of time in the setting that I have now spent in the setting. Mm -hmm. Um, Running it, living it, loving it. He approached me and said, hey, do you want to play? I've been thinking of running a game. And my first Legend of the Five Rings experience was a trial by fire. Yeah. I am kind of beer and pretzels when I run my game. I am not super punishing when it comes to remembering honorifics or, um, you know, making sure that your chopsticks are on the right side of the table. The gentleman that I played with was a taskmaster. Mm-hmm. And, like, bless his cotton socks, I learned so much and developed such an appreciation for the way that the game could be run. And it is it made me study. It made me go and research so many things so that I wouldn't get got in-game. Yeah. And that, I think, put a fire under me to run my games with that same attention to detail and that same love and appreciation of the setting. Mm -hmm. I try to be more lenient with my players because I know that we're all here to have fun. Nobody wants to have to write a essay about who they are and why they're here and all of their, you know, characters, family lineage in order to be admitted to a game. But my expectation is that you're at least going to know what colors you're supposed to wear and why these things are important to your character. Yeah. And what being a twat waffle for you looks like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are important. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the voluntold part came from uh, learning the trading card game. Yeah. Yeah. The role-playing game, that was that was a me decision. <laughs> I guess I can do this. <laughs> I'm ready to be hurt again. This sounds great. <laughs> Speaking of, when was the last time you were a player at a table? Ooh, when was the last time I played in a game of Legend of the Five Rings? <sighs> when I was a young warthog. Um, no. Uh, I think the last person who ran a game of Legend of the Five Rings for me uh, is, is another storyteller that I respect uh, very greatly. He <laughs> he is one of the people who will routinely show up to a table and take a bit of himself and turn it into something entirely different. Mm-hmm. Um, in Specifically in Legend of the Five Rings, this player has reinvented themselves over and over and over and over again. And when they went to run their first game, he provided me with such a unique experience uh, and allowed me to challenge myself and reinvent a part of myself in the game that he ran. Um, it was a zombie conspiracy story <laughs> set in the Crane Lands. Yeah. And at the end of that game, I I lost. You know, I the, the goal that I wanted to accomplish was not accomplished. Uh, I had this, what I thought was a Machiavellian scheme that was going to allow me to bring light to what was happening in the crane lands and unfortunately i died just a little too too quickly but as a product of playing in this game i also got to have just such a unique interaction with another one of the players where we played a game of go in the afterlife together while waiting to be judged by the fortune of death Mm -hmm. and uh that was the last time that i actually got to sit down and and play as a player i find it tough being a player in l5r because I have such strong opinions on how certain clans should be portrayed and about how the setting should be portrayed. Luckily, it was a clan that I don't have any... Like, there's no skin in the game for me when it comes to the crane, mm-hmm. right? I love me a good crane. Some of my best friends are cranes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of cranes in your life, to be honest with you. Oh, uh, yes. And uh, luckily, they're they're all men of quality. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <sighs> But, but yes, um, it, w- it was a wonderful experience uh, being able to be a player for once mm-hmm. in a setting that I adore and feeling like it was really being done justice. That's fair. I'm never running a game for you. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think I would have a great time playing in one of your games, Megan. Um, from the little bit that I've heard and the feedback that I've gotten from uh, the players that were at your L5R game, I bet you would do a bang-up job. Nah. I promise... I won't. Okay, how about this? You don't run a game involving the Dragon Clan at all. Fair enough. And I'll 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 be able to play anything else. Great. You know, I'll <laughs> I'll play a lion. I'll I'll play a mantis. We're going to the unicorn. <laughs> Sweet. Pony power. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, we're wearing the purple. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, do you ever find yourself ever wanting to play D anD D now that you've played L five R? Ah, uh, strangely enough, yes, and. Uh, the folks at It's a Mimic are to blame for that. 
I have been sitting and listening to a lot of the episodes that you guys have been putting out about some of the class breakdowns or certain monsters or like all of the episodes on dragons have in really sparked some inspiration in me about, oh yeah, dragons are these like strange elemental entities that interact with the world and oh oh no, it's an Alpha War thing. Oh yeah, no, let's listen to these episodes on the undead where there's these weird gelatinous formations of multiple zombies together. Damn it, I want to use that as a monster in my game. And it's allowed me to realize that the system is less important than the story. Yep. You know, like I appreciate all of the things that L5R does, but I've been doing it forever. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you just want to engage in something that isn't what you have been doing forever. Mm -hmm. So would I love to play a... Uh, there was a sorcerer's bloodline that I just, I might have been like the moon sorcerer that you guys talked about. Oh yeah, the lunar, um, oh, what is it called? We just did it. Oh, and like, chills. Yeah. I had ideas, let me tell you. Um, would I, would I love to be able to write NPCs and plots that didn't involve, you know, magical cardboard samurai? Yeah, I think that, I think that would be cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I would rather play like one shots or shorter Dungeons and Dragons games. I don't know if I'd be able to necessarily dedicate like a year to a game, but I've always been open to playing other systems and playing in other games. Um, I recently picked up a book called Blades in the Dark, which is a fantasy heist game. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a copy of a book called The Mouse Guard, which for those of you who have ever watched Redwall or read the Redwall books, it's just Redwall, the role playing game. You know, Secrets of Nim, you know, for that yeah, child. Secrets of Nim, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> cute, cute little field mice with swords and shields fighting against giant snakes and owls and badgers and shit. Yeah, sounds like, like a good time. There, there's so many unique systems out there that provide vehicles and avenues for phenomenal storytelling, and like I eat that shit up. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing to remember because I, uh, I've been playing D and D with Dan, Adam, Casey, and basically the It's a Mate podcast crew for now about the same time that I've been playing L five R with you. Yeah. Like it's been running in tangent. I played L five R on Saturdays, and I played D and D on Sunday. That was my weekend. <laughs> it was a good weekend. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Got me through the pandemic. Um, well, actually, no, because we didn't play D&D &D in the pandemic. All I played was Alpha R during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but in playing, the fact that my brain was so focused on L5R for as long as it was without playing D&D, &D, there are things that I brought from L5R into playing my D&D &D campaign around the role-playing aspect of it. Because mm -hmm. I do find that in a couple of the D&D &D campaigns that I've played in, it does become about numbers. It becomes about, you know... Then not who is good at what, but who is conveniently there at the time, if yeah. that makes sense. So, like, if you're picking a lock and you don't have a rogue, it's okay, well, who has that skill? And you're, like, looking at your cheats, trying to figure out who has the best skill to do the thing. Whereas, like, in L5R, that's not how it goes. It is just, like, if this is not what you were meant to do, 90% of the time, you're probably not going to try and do it just based on you as a person. Unless it does something to do with your honor and making sure that you are continuing the path appropriately yeah like, like <laughs> most of the time you wouldn't think to do it yes and like, right? like i remember having a lot of those conversations at the table where it was just like yeah i could do this because i i don't have the skill but i could roll the dice and see what the gods say right and see what the call me if they're on my side you know but like at the same time we're kind of like but would i do that as a character would my character put themselves out there to with the risk of looking like an idiot just to maybe get that pass yeah. Right? Whereas like D&D &D doesn't have that. It's yeah, I'm going to roll fail great. I don't look like an idiot. Like that that stereotype of oh, well, this is what my character would do. It's it's kind of a thing in yeah, Legend of the Fire, yeah. Arms, right? <laughs> like and it's it's important to remember those things, but also yeah. not to be a slave to them. No, no, no. Don't right? be a, again, don't be a twat. Don't be a twat. But like it's it is definitely more structured in that way. In that, like, you are there to perform a role, and you will do things against, like, what your stat block is if it means getting that honor trap and, like, being, like, progressing the storyline and helping the people in, like, in service of your clan. Yeah. You'll put yourself out there. But, like, if I'm just a paladin and the rogue fails at unlocking the door, I'll be like, okay, I'll try it. But, like, sometimes your courtier will be like, nah, I can't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, let's find someone else who can. Like, and then they, and then that's another story build. Instead of everybody at the table trying to unlock this door, it's like, let's go find someone who might be able to do this for us. Oh, the, hey, we should find a guy to do this for us is one of my favorite L5R plot lines. 
oh man, I couldn't possibly carve a chair for this person that we're trying to impress. Do you know a guy? I might know a guy. Yeah, maybe maybe I know somebody. <laughs> oh, jeez. No, it's very true. So he talks a lot about session zero. Yeah. And the things that you talk about. Um, have you, how do you handle that at the table if you touch on a subject that technically was supported within the session zero, but a player has a bad reaction to it? B both as a person and as a storyteller, I am, I try my best to be a paragon of if you're feeling your feelings, just tell me. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I have seen introduced in certain role-playing circles is like a red card or um, making an X in front of your body with, with your arms. Just having a symbol or something that you can display to be like, hey, I'm uncomfortable with what's being uh, discussed and what's being shown. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important to give people the opportunity to walk away yeah. if they need to. But also having the the awareness of like, hey, this is a certain thing that we don't need to engage in in our beer and pretzels like interaction, yeah. right? Sometimes people are perfectly okay with gratuitous violence and uh, depictions of torture. Sometimes people are not okay when you know you you describe a family having to be put to death, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. and and that is okay, mm -hmm. right? I think the most important thing is. And what I've done in the past when these things have come up is I have given us all a break. Yeah. You know, like I've, I've seen the discomfort or I've seen the that moment of, okay, something has been touched. Like, let's all grab water. Let's all have a bio break. Yeah. Um, and I will take a moment to like just shoot a text or to be like, hey, like, do you, do you want to have a talk about this? Like, are you okay? Like, where are you at? Like, do you need a moment? Uh, and sometimes it happens after the session where... You know, I'll, I'll always say, hey, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, just shoot me a message or talk to me. Or if you open communication is the only way that you can <laughs> have functioning relationships, let alone have functioning role playing games. Fair. Um, I never want anybody who sits down at one of my tables to feel like they can't talk to me about what they need from me. Sometimes it's something as simple as like, hey, I haven't had enough opportunities to use this skill on my sheet. Mm -hmm. Can you find more ways of including me in that? Or sometimes it's, hey, I know I wrote this really sad backstory, but I kind of want my character to have like more of a happier life now. Can we navigate in that way? That makes me a better storyteller, and it allows me to provide a better experience for the people that I've chosen to spend four to six hours of my Saturday with. Yeah. I think the best thing that you can do, as always, is just be tuned into your players. Yeah. And listen to your players and engage them in the ways that they like to be engaged. That's fair. Yeah, I remember one of the big pieces of like the session zero that you provided me advice when I was starting the L5R train was the determining what type of game you want to play too. Yeah. Like, is this beer and pretzels? Is this going, do you want Samurai Sadness Simulator? Oh. Do you want like, you know, and I remember I, I posed that question to my crew and they're like, we want a combination of all of it. And I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> so when you're like, comedy has a bit of tragedy and tragedy has a bit of comedy. I'm like, that is what my team forced me to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's important. Yeah. Right. Like for, for most of my longer games, I, I tell people from the beginning, Guys, I'm planning on running a sadness simulator. Who wants to play in the sadness who simulator? Who wants to feel their feelings? And most of my the players who have been with me for a long time are like, yep, bro, well, let's do it. Okay, like this is our general tone. This is what we should be expecting. But a lot of my shorter games, I, I just run anime. Yeah. You know, like, hey, we're going to have a beach episode. Hey, we're going to do this. Hey, you guys are going to try and go and grab the MacGuffin and collect the Infinity Stones and have a grand old time. Yeah. Because role-playing games are supposed to be fun. Yeah, and like if you look at the the world that you've built, there's been in in the Rokugan that we play in years and years and years of legacy characters and adjustments to the empire and things have happened over a period of time. There's always little stupid stories that are going to happen in the background. Oh yes, <laughs> the, she the sheer number of like rat folk sword masters and traveling noodle vendors and all of these things that through one person deciding that they wanted to play it as a PC is now like an integral part of the fabric of the game. It's, it's mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that L5R as a setting really encourages is the legacy Yeah, is you create a thing that exists 
long after you're gone and to have your storyteller and other players talk about it and remember it and being able to interact with those consequences games down the line Mm -hmm. because l5r is a setting with such a rich history to begin with adding to that history and making it your own only serves to endear you to it more and invest you in it more yeah and honestly like that's where i struggled as a player entering your game (laughs) years after it had started to be fair, I did start playing right at the beginning, but it wasn't my system. I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Wasn't my jam. Left. Didn't come back to it. And then there was a point where, like, I was like, no, like, I'll come back. I'll do the thing. And it was because you had one of my legacy characters make a decision I didn't agree with. And so I came back and I played. And I was like, no, no, I'll come back. So I came back and I played. But the biggest struggle for me was I was now playing at a table that people have been playing in this world, like, three generations worth of characters. So there are always moments where they're like, oh my God, it's that character. I'm like, I don't fucking know who that is. And like, so the enjoyment for me was not at the same level at the other people at the table, but I was dedicated to getting myself to that point. So like I made a point to make characters that could potentially have legacy backgrounds, even if they're being played in the background, or I would attach myself to a character who does have a legacy background so that I can like join in that storyline. Like I strategically did things to make the game enjoyable for myself because it was hard to infiltrate myself in a group of people that have been playing for so long. And maybe, maybe that's just a failing on the way that I had set the game up, but your, your life raft was your dedication and your desire to, again, find those legacies that interested you. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I think that that is kind of what you need to do in order to fall in love with Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah. You, you find that one thing that really makes it for you. Yeah. Like the whole reason that I fell in love with the Dragon Clan is because, oh, they're tattooed martial artists who uh, meditate on mountaintops and their tattoos are magical and occasionally they breathe fire and i was like well i do many of those things <laughs> <laughs> which ones you guys can guess um, <laughs> but yeah like it, i think that was the thing that like a lot of my players did was because i would speak about l5r a lot um with my D group and it always came back to like oh well my character's doing this because their brother xyz and this person's playing my sister and this person's playing my like it's so interconnected that that's what interested them the most to the point where when I put them in a situation where their characters were probably going to die, the biggest concern was, no, I want a legacy character. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because that's what they attached themselves to, was they wanted a character that was going to impact the Empire. Yeah. And, like, that's, I don't know. It was it was very heartwarming to me that, like, that was their inspiration. There's a there's a saying that I love, and it's, um, and of course I'm going to butcher it, but I believe it's that wise men plant trees that they will never be able to sit under. Mm. And... That is a lot of what inspires the way that I write L5R. Mm. And what I sort of hope for for people when they play L5R is that you are going to write characters and do things and create things that are going to have long-lasting and long-standing implications that are going to affect characters who play the game three, four campaigns in the future. Yeah. And every time that somebody goes to a Poe Noodle cart, we know that that dude who made the Poe Noodle vendor as his character is is grinning somewhere. Yeah. Every time somebody talks about learning the, you know, the 36 stance style, we know that our buddy who played that that sword master who created the style is like he's living in those moments and you know, we are we are... <laughs> anyone who decides to be a war cartographer just makes me smile inside. Yes. And... <laughs> Anybody who decides to play a war cartographer <laughs> has Megan to thank for that. Um, and, and, and those legacies are timeless, right? Yeah. It's the, so those stories that we tell that remind us that we can be great, right? 100%. But uh, that being said, like, because we spoke at the very beginning that the L5R TCG game yeah. was built around customization. So for anyone who hasn't played the TCG game, what does that actually mean? So... We're going to, okay, I'm going to preface this. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a trading card game for yeah. Legend of the Five Rings. It was sold and turned into a living card game, which is a bit of a different monster. Mm-hmm. I'm going to discuss the trading card game in terms of what that player investment sort of meant at the time. Mm-hmm. In the trading card game, you would go to tournaments, and depending on what clan you chose to play, you would have different choices that you can make in the story of the game as a whole. A prime example of this being that myself and a couple buddies, we went to a tournament down in 
Uh, I want to say it was down in Tacoma, Seattle, Tacoma. And the purpose of this tournament was to determine who the next Oracle of Dark Fire was going to be. Oh, baby. Now, in Legend of the Five Rings, there is a uh, predilection to the Tamori family to become the Oracle of Dark Fire. And there is a group of people who played Dragon who said, no, we don't want another Tamori to become the Oracle of Dark Fire. We have fought so hard and so long to get that shit out of our clan. We don't want bad juju in the clan. But when I first started playing the game, there was a guy, Tamori Wotan, who's got an eye patch, and his flavor text associated with his ability was Wotan shows no mercy, destroy target personality. And I was like, no, Wotan deserves to be the Oracle of Dark Fire. <laughs> so me and five of my homies went down to Seattle Tacoma and played against other people who probably cared more about Wotan not becoming the Oracle of Dark Fire <laughs> than I cared about Wotan becoming the Oracle of Dark Fire. And through collusion and shenanigans, I went home with a katana, a wakazashi, a bunch of other trophies. And if the game had continued, I would have had my name printed on a card that would have represented this storyline decision. Yeah. There was a story written that had Wotan as a part of it in his role as the Oracle of Darkfire. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of the reason why people played L5R. Because you could go and show up to an event playing the thing that you loved, and you could make this character that you like a champion. Could make them a god. The <laughs> in in the Legend of the Five Rings canon fourth edition rules, the whole reason that the Empress, Iweko the First, is the Empress is because in the trading card game and in the living role-playing game that was going on at the time, it, during the race for the throne, uh, Kitsuki Iweko mm -hmm. was elevated to become Empress through the hard work of multiple people playing dragon, playing as dragons, being dragons. They elevated this character to be Empress. Mm -hmm. the, the trading card game allowed me to meet some unbelievably talented people, both you know, from a gaming perspective and in their personal lives. Um, people who in their personal lives were lawyers and doctors and artists and just the entire gamut, but we were all brought together because of our love of cardboard samurai. <laughs> right? Putting money into cardboard. <laughs> right. And honestly, if it hadn't been for the TCG, I don't think I would have fallen in love with the role-playing game. Yeah. That, that, that first hit was the strongest hit. Yeah. And because I... Saw it and I saw the setting. I was like, oh man, the setting's super cool. I wish I could do this. And then, of course, I met the uh, the remarkably talented storyteller mm -hmm. who presented it to me. It, uh, it changed my life. I have tattoos mm -hmm. from Legend of the Five Rings. You do. Yeah. I, I have uh, <laughs> firmly cemented a lot of my behavior and harpooned people that I love and care about into this crazy, long-spanning bit of nonsense. And uh, I hope that I can do the same for some of y'all. <laughs> well, on that note, is there any final thoughts, feelings, or emotions towards Elf or you want to get out now before we continue this train wreck? Couldn't possibly get them out now. So <laughs> yeah. um, I hope you guys are all ready for the rest of this journey. Because uh, it'll be legendary. <laughs> okay, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's all for this first episode of this series on Legend of the Five Rings. Make sure to like and comment so we can drive up engagement and spread the word about this great game to other people. And don't forget to follow or subscribe, because next episode will focus on the world and setting of this Samurai Sadness Simulator. For more info and details, please check out the show notes. When you're resolved from the beginning, you will not be perplexed. This understanding extends to everything. Be resolved, young samurai, and tell the world what you have witnessed here today.